for today's sessions. We are very pleased to have Amartya Ganguly from TU Munich. And um, just to briefly introduce himself. So Amartya earned his PhD from the University of Hull uh, in UK. As a postdoc at Kiel University, he contributed to the state-of-the-art uh, upper lip uh, neuromusculoskeletal models currently, which are used today. Selected for Horizon 2020 in OSAP, he worked at Marcy Bionics, um, testing the world's first pediatric exoskeleton and establishing a biomechanics lab with CSIC, CAR Madrid. He developed hand models for clinical use in an EIT health project at University of Heidelberg in Germany and holds expertise in neuromusculoskeletal modeling, C certification, wearable assistive devices, and clinical trials. A recipient of uh, an Indo-German early career award, he leads the Intelligent Neuroprosthesis Research Group here at TU Munich and has contributed to the EU Cost Action Initiative for Variable Robotics. Uh, and today he's going to talk about merging fiction with reality, uh, prosthetic advances, and the Luke Skywalker paradigm. Uh, Amartya, I think the stage is all yours. Thank you, Rudivan, and thank you, Talking Robotics, for inviting me um, to present some of my work and some of my team's work. So, as all of you know, that Star Wars is a big thing, and I hope some of you are as big a fan of Star Wars as I am, particularly the name Luke Skywalker and uh, the main hero of the franchise. And for us prosthetics people, there's something of a uh, paradigm that we are hoping to achieve since we the movie came out. So to start off with, let's look at what what does it mean to uh, to lose your arm in different parts of the world? Um, at globally, you will see like there's a big switch between where um, who needs the prosthesis and where uh, the prosthesis users are. So in this case, in this map, you see about and globally, 0.5% of the people need prosthesis or orthosis of different kinds at different levels. But most of the prosthesis users are around Asia. Um, for This could be for various reasons. It could be because the largest density of population is there. There has been more wars there. Um, agricultural accidents are the leading cause for these kinds of um, uh, for limb difference, uh, but there are many causes as I will go through it slowly. First, let's look at how a person becomes a prosthesis user. Um, there are three categories. The largest cause is trauma. Um, it could be for various reasons. It could be an accident. It could be, uh, um, you know, um, different kinds of accidents that you have to work uh, to in workplaces, uh, maybe war, um, other reasons. Um, the other could be uh, you're born with it, it's congenital, it could be genetic, um, it could be complications due to birth. And finally, the rare cases is cancer. Generally, it's bone cancer, and then you tend to lose your limb. But I'll be make, mainly focusing on trauma and um, yeah, um, how this kind of affects and what are different kinds. So first, uh, at workplace hazard, depending on what kind of work you do, could be at the factory, you could be a farmer, um, where you uh, work with not very supervised or safety related um, equipment, could be sharp objects, it could be something that crushes uh, your hand and you've accidentally put something there. Um, so that is a leading cause. Uh, in many countries, many uh, checks have been taken to prevent such damage. However, in many other places, no such safety standards exist. Uh, recently, we've been seeing a lot of armed conflict uh, in the world. It's one of the significant 
reasons for limb loss and uh, very poor conditions of how um, these uh, people are rehabilitated. And then frostbite. If you're living in a cold country, there's a lot of, uh, you don't have, uh, you've had a mountain climbing accident or you are an avid mountaineer in the snow, there's uh, possibly frostbite is also a leading cause for lip loss. Okay, so now let's see when was the first hand. People have been losing hands for a very long time. The first one, the first recorded uh, hand uh, prosthesis was done in Greece in 77 AD. We don't have the picture for it, but it was recorded that uh, a prosthesis uh, made out of iron, a blacksmith at the time made it for one of uh, his customers. Um, the second that we know of is was in circa 1505, and believe it not, uh, it was made in Bavaria, currently where I'm here, not too far from Munich, actually. And a blacksmith made it for one of his lords uh, with complete uh, fashion, completely with straps and uh, uh, movement of your all your fingers so that he could hold the reins of his horse and from then on like the, this kind of prosthesis within this um, framework has been going on since 1505 but then comes as all of you know Captain Hook as you see Hook being the main prosthesis and this was started between 1902 to 1953. You might have seen different kinds of many movies where sailors, often pirates, were would sport an eye patch or have a hook. And hook is very convenient to do lots of different kinds of activities, as I will show you. Since then, there hasn't been major advances in prosthesis from 1902 until we have Empire Strikes Back our favorite character, Luke Skywalker. So you see uh, his droid builds him an identical hand, like his left hand. He can move it, there is dexterity, there is feeling. It almost looks as if he hasn't lost his hand. But that is what creative artists tell us. And us scientists, we are struggling to keep up with them. This was thought of in 1980. Coming to 2016, we see uh, um, uh, the, the hand that is done in Cybertron, which is a competition done in Zurich in every four years. If you look at that hand, uh, you would see it's a hook with another th opposing thumb. And this particular person was able to complete all the tasks in record time and was declared the winner. And it's not battery powered, it is body powered. So that means you activate part of your body and the hook sort of opens up and you're just able to grab something. And that is 2016, that is claimed so far to be the best hand. So from Captain Hook to 2016, from 1902 to 2016, we are still within that frame and nowhere close to what we think what a Luke Skywalker hand would look like. And then 2014, you all know, uh, fans of comics, uh, Winter Soldier, this is by far my favorite fictional hand. It's very powerful, it's very dexterous. Uh, there's no end to creativity. So if you're to compare that to 2000. So this year, 2023, she is the world's first bionic woman. So she was implanted with a prosthesis and then the prosthesis was uh, attached surgically to a bone marrow. And then there were some electrodes implanted invasively and then that would take signals from the brain and then open the hand. But then again, there's no feeling it still looks like, you know, uh, a robotic hand. And uh, 
So although it is coming close to what we envisioned in 1980, but it's still quite far off. So I want to share with you how we kind of deconstruct the whole thing. So this is what I would say, deconstructing the, the Luke Skywalker paradigm. How do we achieve such, um, such a hand? In order to do this, so we need to understand how our human hand moves and how we kind of gather all this information and then translate that to a functioning prosthesis. So in order, as the robotist might know, like we would need the pose, like how we need the length and width of the hand. We know we need to know the dimensions of a person in order to make an equivalent model. So we capture using motion capture um, cameras. So these are um, infrared cameras. You've got uh, markers that are attached to your hand. This is often used in um, current Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings movies that you see. So you've got all these cameras to a very high precision and we capture uh, the state of the hand uh, status, uh, in, a stats, in a static position. And then we kind of make a musculoskeletal model with, uh, as you can see uh, in this figure. And then the next step is to facilitate the physics contact, like how do we interact with the environment? So that part we have to, uh, there's a lot of science that has got gone on on contact mechanics, um, like how do the uh, fingers uh, wrap around an object, what's the physics behind it, how, how does an object deform, collide, and we need to simulate that sort of environment to understand how we can develop a functioning prosthesis. So that was static task. So now when we take a dynamic movement, for example, we're trying to flex a finger as shown here. So we use these the data from the finger flexion, and then we upload it to a physics engine. We can also do that using EMG. So EMG is sort of a sensor where we record muscle activity. So often we will not have these kind of specialized equipment. We would only have um, record muscle activity, and then we drive um, the model. So sometimes when we have this model, uh, we are restricted in lab conditions. What do we do with it? How can we then interact with the environment? Because uh, this, sometimes we don't have the senses. It is impossible to sensorize the entire environment around us. So we augment the data. So we have uh, contact mechanics that we've established before. We simulate the same data and how we uh, we create an object, arbitrary object, and see how the simulation is acting within uh, a simulated environment. So this is a very easy task comparatively, but can we do something like this, a complex task that is only done by our amazing human hand? Can we achieve this form of dexterity in a prosthesis? But to know this, to know to do this kind of task, we also need to rely on the skin because it gives us a sensation of um, the object that we have. But so far, you know, there is no skin available. There's no artificial skin that we know of that can help us uh, interact with the environment. So we are trying to develop a soft skin that can measure contact and can wrap around any object, how cool would be that? But with all of this, we are now missing the neural data. So if you need to feel something artificially, we also need to feed it back to our bodies so that we know what we're feeling. So if, you're, if you don't have an arm and you've got an iron hand from 1505 as we talked before, how do you know what are you, what kind of object you're holding? I mean, you can see it, but 
You don't know where it is in space. You don't know what it feels like. You don't know if the coffee that you've, uh, coffee cup that you're holding is hot or cold. We don't have this information. So in order to do this, we decided to develop artificial skin. So, but how do we do this? Uh, I'm gonna show how we build low cost artificial skin now. So let's just play this video. So we use uh, existing 3D printer and we kind of replaced certain components as marked here so that we push in soft materials onto a Petri dish. The carbon ink is directly printed now in a silicon matrix. And we can create different shapes, patterns that are better suited for um, detecting contact, the change in resistance. And this has been shown quite, quite reliable. And then we would like to include this as like a glove. So now that we know how to do this, let's wrap it around random objects, but how do we do it automatically? Otherwise, you know, this is gonna take us ages to complete. So in this video, we show how we do this in an automatic framework. So we take, we scan a 3D object, and then we flatten it. It's almost like gift wrapping the same object with these artificial sensors. So we place a particular set of pattern that we we think is going to give us the best contact at every um, lapel, as you would, would call it here. And now we have many different kinds of objects. So we decided to see, can we put it on a robotic finger and see if we can control it with our hand. Looks like we can, not too shabby. Now we are just trying to test different surfaces. So what we did at every service, we kind of normalized the values so that the comparison between each sensor would be similar because all of this is handmade. It's not uh, mass produced. So the resistance at every sli uh, side is slightly different, but we are able to get the desired result of, depending on the, how the shape or the size of the object we have been able to create sort of a artificial skin that could go on a prosthesis or the environment the prosthesis is trying to interact with. So now that we have an environment, what do we do with the prosthesis? What are the problems of uh, designing a prosthesis. 
So for us, the first thing that we're looking for is the kind of tasks a prosthesis user is going to do in their daily lives. Uh, and then, depending on these tasks, what is the force required at every joint of disarticulation that we need to consider in order to build the prosthesis? So for now, we consist we're considering the wrist joint and seeing what would be the ideal uh, torques and forces required to build something like this. Now that we have the right kind of torques required, um, we need to, let's say we build the prosthesis, but then how do we control it from um, the person who needs the prosthesis? So as you can see, for an example, you have a transradial amputee. Um, so this person um, is, from India in a small village. And he had to travel about a thousand kilometers to get to uh, the first uh, uh, clinic, with this, which is the BMVSS, where they give uh, body powered prosthesis for free. So when he came to the clinic, uh, they said that, um, okay, you have a uh, the, the remaining residual limb is quite good, but there is the muscles are weak. So the reason is that uh, the way his hand was cut. So since he's a farmer, he was feeding hay into a crop machine which cuts the crop. Unfortunately, his whole hand went through. So of course, this led to massive bleeding. And over the years, what has happened was that as the muscles were cut, 
there was, you know, there's no bone there right now, not as much. So there is fluid buildup at the end. The muscles have weakened because the blood supply is not going there. And there is a possible case of neuron. So if you were to put the EMG electrodes, which I talked about before, you're not going to get a very clean signal and you wouldn't know which muscle to put in because the whole hand is missing. So what do we do then? How do we generate signals from these um, from amputees in order to control the prosthesis? In that case, we finally enter the realm of machine learning and AI. So we put signals, uh, the electrodes around their stump and the, around the residual limb, and then we create an ML model. And then we look at the different patterns at which the muscles uh, fire. Within that, then we convert all of those signals into an actuation command. So that is we're converting voltage signals that we get from the muscles into joint angles in order to control or open or close the prosthesis. So in order to simulate that, we have to calibrate it. Imagine this is the, um, th the lady who is uh, demonstrating the different poses, the armband she's wearing, she's got eight sensors there, and she's calibrating for different poses because you know, as a prosthesis user, you will be using your prosthesis for any task any different positions or the loads that's going to come up. So then we asked multiple users to use it in a virtual reality environment with a weighted glove. So that will show uh, different weights that a person would be handling during their activities of daily living. And then to match that with the virtual reality environment, the tasks that they do. So once you're familiar with the experiment, we did some testing and real-time control. And we concluded that the, we have an accuracy for about 95%. But you have to recalibrate it every time, every day after some amount of use. So, but the calibration time is shortened every time. So the model itself learns how different the weight is, where the hand is in the, um, what the hand is doing, at what position it's doing, at what orientation, it's performing a particular action. And then it recalibrates it. And then uh, it is much easier for the user to use their prosthesis. So now we have been able to, we've seen skin. We know how the hand moves. We know how the prosthesis works with, uh, with the person who's an amputee and how we generate the signals. But what about the brain? The brain does send signals. And how do we send the signals back? How does the body know how we are interacting with the prosthesis? In order to do that, we did an experiment. So here, the example is of grasping, you know, a jar, and then we fill it with water. So the main sensors, biological sensors that we have, that we're looking into is cutaneous, that is um, the skin on the fingertips in this case, and then the weight of the object. So whenever we handle uh, any object in our, uh, environment, for example, uh, you know, holding this jar and someone's pouring this water, the weight is increasing and a body is inherently detecting it. So Golgi tendons, the Golgi tendon organs, these are the biological sensors. These are basically act as force sensors. They detect the change in weight. And then muscle spindles, they detect the change in length of the muscle. So then that information then gets fed back into the brain. So how do we generate all of this? Because you know, cut, we cannot cut open a live person and then you know, start fiddling around with their nervous system 
it's really quite dangerous and we will never get ethical clearance for it. So we decided to generate artificial neural signals. So in this case, in this experiment, we are seeing that the person is adjusting their normal force on the, on the cup. There's friction. And there's a change of torque computed in the musculoskeletal model. We also have a model for the uh, Golgi tendon and the cutaneous receptors. So if you would see the force required to grab the object and the, the neural signal produced, it looks very similar. So we know that this is almost like a one-to-one -one relationship between the force that is being adjusted and the force that we sort of calculate uh, through all these equations or the four senses that we have. It is, um, it is it's quite accurate. So we are very confident in our uh, the behavior of the neural signals. And if you look at the cutaneous receptors, based on the force, you've got four different kinds of sensors. The SA1 calculates uh, the nerve signals for the normal force. The SA2 calculates the lateral force. The RA1 computes the time, first time derivative of the of the whole of the force of um, the lateral and the normal force, and the RA2 calculates um, your second time derivative. So this is the spike train that that gets fed into the body and the brain realizes, okay, this is how, what the cup feels like, uh, whether it's hard, whether it's soft, whether you can deform it, what kind of texture it is. So we all know this from this kind of information. So now what do we do? Now we have all the right information. So let's see how the mechanism really works. So in the green, the afferent motor. It's basically what is the body is telling us how we're interacting with the environment. We know the weight of the object. We know how it feels. We know um, uh, the signals that are being produced from the brain, for, even visually. Then we feed it to the musculoskeletal model. The musculoskeletal model tells us exactly what joint angles to look for, where is the environment in space. We feed that to the prosthesis. And the prosthesis has skin. The prosthesis also has the um, equivalent for senses, the, uh, the Golgi tendon organs or your skin receptors that we saw previously. Let's say we have it at the fingertip. We feed it back to the model. The, the model now has the simplified muscle spindle and Golgi tendon organs, which then go back into the peripheral nervous system. And then the body sort of, it's sort of like a human in the loop experiment. Well, now we can say it's like the complete feedback loop is done. We can say we are se sending the information and the user is able to interact with the environment and that the same environment is giving us this information and we're feeding it back to a central nervous system. So finally, if you see at the right in the GIF, you have a person who is only recording their muscle signals. She's doing uh, some kind of movement. And this EMG signals are then converted into joint angles within this musculoskeletal model. And then a robotic or a prosthetic hand is moving seamlessly. But I mean, I wouldn't say seamless. Uh, there is a bit of delay, but you know, we're all working on this. The only thing now missing is pain and reflexes. And otherwise, we're pretty much there with the Luke Skywalker par paradigm. So this is what the animators in 1980 thought of. But is it enough? Is the Luke Skywalker or these Iron Man related hands is what the prosthesis want? So there is a divided opinion. Open Bionics in the UK has done an amazing job in 
with 3D printing and uh, creating futuristic looking hands that many people would like. They're active, they're powered by EMG, and it has uh, really helped um, many people. On the other hand, there are many users who say that I do not want to draw attention to myself. I do not want to be the object of attention. I would just like to be like my fellow person. So I would like to have a hand that looks like everybody else's. So cosmetic hands are also very popular. It is also low cost. It is it can be body powered, but it is not doesn't have that much of actuation or doesn't have batteries, doesn't have that much of technology. It's just a, a cosmetic hand. So Enhance, which is a student group from my group, uh, we've created some of these and I'll talk more about Enhance a little bit, both silicone and what it looks like, um, uh, like in 3D printed form. So why do we have this kinds of perception? Why this two perception? It's also linked with income. So in 2019, World Bank did a study and kind of formulated in the world, what are the high income groups and what are the low income groups that's there in gray. If you recall the previous graph, 0.5% of the um, population of the world, like 80%, all of the amputees live in Asia. And if you see, most of these countries are also low income groups. So a low cost prosthesis in Germany might not be low cost in a remote village in Nepal, might not be low cost like a uh, remote village in India. So what do we do then? So then prosthetic uh, body powered or cosmetic hands are much more in favor. Why? Because they want to integrate within the society. Um, girls don't get married because uh, they don't have a hand. Uh, it is very important for them to feel like they're part of society. They're not secluded. There's ostracization. And because of that, the idea to empower them to lead a healthy life, to lead an independent life becomes crucial. But they may not be able to afford a bionic arm. So we at Enhance, at TU Munich, uh, trying to develop a low cost, passive, robust, with the local distribution system that's there. So this is some of our concept designs that we have for a functioning prosthesis. It's almost like a flipper that you can grasp some tools that you could use for your activities and you can rotate the wrist. Similarly, these are the mechanics of the wrist design that we have, have in mind. And we are looking at uh, sustainable solutions. We have distributed right now about 36 hands across Pakistan, Nepal, and Bangladesh. And we are hoping to do some more uh, as the new designs come out. My research has been funded by many different universities from UK to USA, France, Germany, and India. And I'm very grateful for the funding that has come through to help me do this kind of work. And all of this would not be possible without my team. Sonia, she works with Tactile Sensing. She's also co-founder with me of Enhance. Jonan works mainly on modeling and control. Mohamed Fatoni, he works with EMG and drives state-of-the-art myoelectric prosthesis. Christopher, he designs a problem prosthesis from shoulder, elbow to wrist. And I help them to make all of this uh, happen. And over the years, I am very grateful with all the mentors and friends that I've had who've helped me in my research and with the amazing results that we have so far. And thank you and the may the force be with you.
Thank you, uh, Amartya, for the wonderful talk. Um, I think we can now have some questions. Maybe I can I can start. So, um, what do you think is like the biggest challenge in bringing this technology to like everyone, even in like um, high income countries? Because I think it's not very well adopted here as well. I mean, some of the biggest challenges that we have is that this is not a single person job. It is complex in terms of understanding uh, the human hand, the amputation, the technologies required to it. You need mechanical, electrical, mechatronics, um, neural engineers. Uh, there is problems with uh, what you call the electronics being accepted by the body, for example, all the invasive work that so many people have done, there's a very high rejection rate. So the to give a brief account, 2023, the first bionic woman, the, the picture that I showed, um, it took a collaboration between three different countries, Sweden, Italy, and USA. Uh, she had implanted electronics for three years, the concept of OSI integration, where you implant the, the prosthesis into the bone marrow has taken about at least 20 years to happen, uh, to have very little rejection. And now they've developed this hand, the Mia hand, uh, and integrated that. So the, it's, it's a work culminating 25 years. And you can only imagine how you get selected for something the hand itself costs about $30,000. Uh, the cost and the planning behind all of this is tremendous. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. And in terms of like invasive and non-invasive procedures, which one do you think is more suitable for a wider um, audience or user? I think invasive is still better. You get a lot of cleaner signals but the problem lies with uh, the expertise required to do this. Not many countries have the same, have the expertise to do the invasive. Now, but is one, it also feasible for like a long term? Yes, uh, some of them are, uh, but some of them are not. So like also integration is now. So when I started my PhD, I was like listening to hearing about also integration coming up really quickly, but um, there was a lot of, um, problems with post-surgery. There's a lot of infection that was happening. But then if you also have the implanted electrodes, there was a lot of nerve degeneration. But then that the technology has come up, come through and that has been mitigated. But I'm still in favor of non-invasive solutions because you can drive the costs down, the expertise, you don't need to cut where it's not required. The risks are lower. And then with... Uh, AI taking a huge leap forward, maybe it's just possible to do that. And perhaps we might look at amputation and grasping and interacting with the environment slightly differently. Thanks a lot, Martia. Really amazing work. I actually got the question while we were presenting. Um, I like the, the framework. But what about the intersection? Like you have a couple of components, right? Mm -hmm. But then I know that's still a long way to go, like to get mm -hmm. something quite similar. But wouldn't you lose a lot from system point of view, like system design by mm -hmm. having a couple of steps, but a little, at least in the presentation, a little mm -hmm. at the intersection? Or... <laughs> You mean the neural interface from like uh, getting the signals from the muscles and then... I mean, every every block, let's say, from mm -hmm. the framework you show would be an approximation, right? Yes. But then maybe there is a lot to do at the interface between the approximation. So it's not like getting ideal for each block, yeah. but actually the, the you don't need to be that much optimized per component, but rather as a whole system. Exactly. So that is why we have a training period. Now, if you imagine yourself learning a new skill, right? If, if you've never, for example, you know, 
played table tennis. I'm just giving a random example. It's a skill that you learn. And every time you, uh, it depends on the amount of time you spend with it, with the sport, and you slowly and gradually become very good at it. So if you're wearing a prosthesis, uh, you are employing the same uh, kind of skill. You're just learning how to use a different hand. I mean, that already happens. For example, uh, you have a body powered prosthesis and then you switch to one of these bionic limbs that we have. And then this switch, you are retraining yourself as to how you're going to interact with the environment, how you're going to interact with the interface that's already there. You know about the delays of the systems. And then you, after a certain period, I think, I think the average is about six weeks that you get really comfortable with the prosthesis. And then you are able to make it work for the needs of the environment that you can interact with. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, I don't want to take much time, but mm -hmm. I was rather the question more on the, thanks for the answer, in the direction like from system point of view, like system engineering, how would okay. you select which hierarchy or which connection between those blocks? Yeah. Because for now you do one, you take output, you take it to another, yeah. And you iterate the process depending yeah. on the habituation period you have or the training. Yeah. Yeah. But would it already having such a study? I, I know that there would be a lot of lack mm -hmm. of data. Mm -hmm. Tell you a different arrangement of the blocks themselves. How they, do they interact? Maybe I mean, the, the, the musculoskeletal model doesn't go only forward. Mm -hmm. Or there are internal loops already. That's what I meant. Yeah, it is It is quite possible. Um we are doing it sequentially uh, because it is mainly at first to really understand the mechanics, the pathway. Yes. If the pathway is uh, not clearly understood uh, or we don't know where to kind of tap into it uh, at different pathways, like what is the easiest way or what's the safest way to tap into this pathway? Once we know that, then it is easier to optimize the whole thing and then uh, system engineering, as you've just said, uh, would be would come up with more than one solution. I would say. Yeah, thank you. Maybe another quick question from my side. In terms of commercial companies, um, there are not many players out there doing these kind of things as compared to traditional robotics. Like, why do you think this is the case, and is it going to improve in the near future? And uh, what are your thoughts about this? Uh, I mean, the biggest uh, commercial uh, prosthetics companies uh, would be Autobach or Soar, I would say. They've done a great job with uh, lower limb prosthesis. Uh, so as far as um, amputees are concerned, lower limb has the highest population. And then you have transradial. But since you don't have that many patients to, uh, to make, because you're ultimately selling a product, if you don't have buyers, that means your cost is going to increase anyways, and we also have the complexity. So mm -hmm. either, and these current technologies cost quite a lot. Like if you have small actuators, small motors, miniaturizing these things is already a very costly endeavor. So you are not going to get one many players to do this. And those who do, they've really established the market. But the science is also left so we, I would say it is, I, I would recommend the staying in academia if you're doing prosthesis work, um, because you have a much more chance in learning the pathways, um, studying um, what is good, what is bad, and then informing industry as to this is the course you take. And then let's throw more money at this and make it cost effective. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Um, I think if there are no more questions, we're almost um, close to our um, yeah, ending time. Thanks a lot for um, coming and speaking here, Amartya. It thank you so much for inviting talk. and thank you so much for all the questions. Very great and very thought provoking.